Have you ever wanted to conduct cross-cultural research but don't know where to start? Or are you interested in learning about how various psychological variables may look in different cultures? These are the first two lines of a new Ion Psychi magazine article by Kelly Kukola, who invites student and faculty researchers from around the world to become involved in the first Psychi Crowd Research Project. Hi, it's Bradley again from the Psychi Central Office. I'm bringing you another installment of Diverse Voices, which is a series of episodes in the Psych Everywhere podcast. As you might know, the first four interviews of this podcast series were conducted at the Convention for the Society for Cross-Cultural Research, that's SCCR, in Jacksonville, Florida. Well, I would be remiss if I attended a convention about cross-cultural research and I didn't interview Kelly Kukola, who also happened to be present at the convention. Kelly is the chair for Psychi's Network for International Collaborative Exchange, that's NICE, N-I-C-E, Sakai NICE promotes a variety of opportunities to become involved in cross-cultural research. Kelly has been doing an incredible job of expanding and promoting Sakai research opportunities, so the first question I asked her was to tell us a little about NICE Crowd. I think you'll enjoy what she has to say. So, uh, first of all, like Bradley mentioned, I am the chair of Psychi's NICE. The NICE is the Network for International Collaborative Exchange. And the crowd is essentially a crowdsourcing project where we have a large group of researchers focused around answering a common specified research question. So what our current project is focused on, it was uh, proposed by Mary Musa Rogers and Cliff McKinney uh, from Mississippi State University. And what they're interested in doing is trying to see if a particular model of family functioning, uh, the family circumplex model, fits across cross-cultural samples. Uh, so Mary's kind of vision for the project is that um, this sample has been kind of normed with northeastern U.S. regions, northeastern U.S. families, and she wants to see if that model can predict various outcomes in children um, and things like family cohesion among different cultural samples, both within the U.S. and outside of the U.S. Okay, awesome. Um, so what is, for readers or listeners who aren't quite aware, what is sort of the value and benefit of becoming involved in a cross-cultural project like this? I, okay, so I could probably talk forever about this because um, I think there are so many benefits, but I think I'll kind of uh, break it up into for students and researchers and then kind of generally. I think the benefit for students to join a project like this is one, you're going to get exposure to working with diverse samples of participants. You're also going to get experience working with a diverse team of collaborators, which really allows you to build these, you know, professional development skills and networking and um, making those connections that are vital for academic and professional growth. You're also really going to be able to kind of utilize uh, problem solving and those critical thinking skills because as a contributor on this project you do have the options to play with the data and ask your own questions and run your own tests and just kind of you know really work through the scientific method um, and there's also the opportunity for publication so students have really this this golden opportunity to have all this support, all these collaborators helping them to make a meaningful contribution to the field. Um, and we know cross-cultural research is so important because the more diverse our participants um, that we sample, the better or the more generalizations and benefits can be distributed to, you know, the general population instead of our uh, studies only applying to a really specific set of the population, like uh, white college students or people from a particular region of the United States, those benefits can apply more holistically. For faculty, I would say the benefit of joining these sorts of projects are 
one, you can implement it in the classroom fairly easily, which is awesome. Uh, it provides your students with a way to work through the scientific method at no cost. We take care of a lot of kind of the groundwork, uh, providing you with the protocol and the measures that you need to collect the data. You kind of just have to run with it and go. Um, and then for faculty also, there's the opportunity for publication. And I just think generally these sorts of projects derive large samples which are great for powering our studies adequately. We can be really confident that the results are credible and robust and um, just really exposure and seeing the world and asking questions from different perspectives. Okay, well, I know the project is growing very quickly. Yeah. It's doing really well. So uh, exactly how many teams do you have participating and in which countries? That's a great question. I should pull up that sheet. Uh, so we have a good amount of contributors who have completed data collection and then also a number of um, contributors who are still in the process of submitting their institutional review board. Um, documents. And so the bulk of our people, let's see, this will give us an exact number. Um, so currently we have about 59 contributors. Uh -huh. um, about 17 of those people are completely um, in either the data collection phase or are done. The rest of those contributors are still working on gathering um, the appropriate documents to submit to their institutional review boards. We have um, a number of contributors from outside the United States. We have someone from Turkey, we have Switzerland, we have China, um, Nigeria, and Guam, which is a territory, but mm -hmm. still kind of promoting those at least cross-cultural boundaries. And then we have uh, 16 different U.S. states. Wow. Yeah. That, is, it is, that is so exciting. I can't wait to see when all the data comes together, oh, what, what all you're going to find. Yeah. There are 3,000 cases already, and that's just with the 17 contributors having completed. So... Cool. Um, so having worked with so many of these teams, do you have any tips for future participants? Yeah, so I would say um, the best advice that I can give you if you're interested in participating in the future is to just stay really vigilant about checking our Open Science Framework page, our OSF. Um, that is where we house all things NICE. So that's where you'll find all your instructions. That's where you'll find all the materials and uh, supportive materials. Like we do have a toolkit for researchers who aren't as experienced with submitting institutional review board documents. So things get uploaded to that page fairly regularly. And uh, we've had some people kind of fall behind because they forget to check it. Um, you know, with 59 people, you don't want to be emailing everyone constantly. <laughs> um, so it's, yeah, I would say that that's kind of where people fall off. And, and once they get back on track by checking that, that tends to, to just make things run really smoothly. The other thing I would think about um, is just recruitment. I think a lot of the nice thing about these projects is they lessen the burden on smaller institutions. They don't need to recruit as many people, but I would just try and think about a recruitment plan, you know, as you're preparing the ethical review board documents. That way when you get approval, you're ready to go and can keep the process of data collection running pretty smoothly. The third thing I think is just have fun with it. Like it is a great opportunity to see and t well to see patterns in data that you wouldn't normally get a chance to because you have access to this diverse sample. And so I advise like the faculty participants to really consider like inviting their students in and letting them kind of take the the reins and the wheel and seeing what they come up with, what questions and perspectives they can bring to the table. You're listening to Diverse Voices in Psychology. Real quick, let me tell you a little about today's guest speaker. Kelly is a graduate student at the University of North Dakota. 
Her main research interest lies in understanding how various health behaviors impact cognition. She is additionally interested in open science initiatives and the teaching of psychology. Kelly has chaired Psychi's Network for International Collaborative Exchange for two years, during which she implemented the first crowd project. Through chairing this project, Kelly has become increasingly interested in advocating for open science practices and diversity in psychological research. She hopes to graduate with her PhD and obtain a job as a full-time professor. This interview took place at around 7 p.m. after a long day of sessions at the SCCR convention. But even though we were both tired, we weren't too tired to talk about Psychi Crowd. Let's continue with the interview as Kelly shares a little about why the particular project was chosen for Psychi Crowd. So the way the project was chosen is through the NICE planning committee, uh, which is made up of myself and then a team of undergraduate students, graduate students, and also faculty. So we try and get a few different types of perspectives in there. And we actually do have kind of a proposal review sort of rubric that we use to evaluate the projects. And so this project kind of checked all of our boxes. And so I can talk about a few of those things. One thing that was a complete necessary component is that the project authors completed a pre-registration template. So this is an open science focused project and pre-registration templates essentially force you to outline you know, your goals for the project, the research methods, it's an a priori commitment to the research plan. And so in order to make sure that the analyses were robust, that the hypotheses were developed like a priori, and just to make sure that we had kind of like the gold standard of quality, um, that was a requirement. Um, and also so future researchers who want to use the data can kind of have this script, and if anybody ever wanted to replicate the study, they have that script available to them. So that was a necessary component. And then we kind of broke things down into cultural sensitivity. Um, appropriateness of the question for cross-cultural application was particularly important. So we wanted it to be something that would apply to everyone or be of interest to many different people. We also wanted to make sure that the methods that the researchers proposed were robust um, and appropriate for usage in different uh, cross-cultural settings. So we try to look at or evaluate if the scales had translations. So if they were only in English, that kind of really limited us unless contributors were willing to do a lot of legwork beforehand. And then um, we looked at things like data transparency and design transparency, making sure the researchers were okay with the fact that the data would be publicly available um, because we do want to promote the usage of the data set for people who might be at smaller institutions or just not have access to these sorts of diverse data sets. And then we also looked at uh, feasibility. So obviously it's a little bit easier to run a self-report survey to administer self-report than it is to do um, sort of some sort of actual experimental manipulation. Then we also looked at feasibility, or sorry, we did look at feasibility. And then the final thing we looked at was long-term impact or significance. So did we feel like the project was gonna contribute significantly to the literature and um, kind of be able to spur future research and future work in this particular area? Well, how did you become involved in crowd? <laughs> That's a great question. I actually <laughs> love telling this story. So uh, I've been a Psychi member since my undergraduate oh. career, so for a few years now. And so I still get the, the mailing list when you when uh -huh. I on Psychi and the magazine and things like that and the blogs are, are sent out. I get the email notifications. And I saw, yeah, yeah, thumbs up, right? Like, that's <laughs> awesome. Um, I was reading through, and I just remember seeing an announcement. People were looking for a chair or you know, t t talking about the project basically. And I was like, you know, that's kind of interesting. I've been wanting to get more involved in like cross-cultural research, but I just don't know how, um, which I think is a barrier for a lot of people that the NICE kind of breaks down. 
And so I was looking at the applications, talk, you know, um, looking at the applications and really hesitant about submitting one. I remember it being laid out on the OSF. I had never used the OSF before. I was kind of like, what is, what is this? Um, and so I wasn't gonna submit. I was like, I don't think they're looking for me. I don't think they're looking for a grad student. I think this is for somebody in my mind who is way further in their career. Um, but I was thinking about it. And so I remember I was with my one of my best friends I was telling her about it and I was like, yeah, I don't think I'm going to do it. The deadline is in like an hour. <laughs> and she was like, just do it. What's the worst that can happen if you submit it? So we went home and spent that last hour submitting all my materials that I had prepared and was just <laughs> too too anxious to hit submit. Um, and yeah, so I think I submitted it like one minute before the deadline because <laughs> I was, you know, just didn't think that I stood a chance essentially, but I guess that positive lesson here is, you know, just go for it. What's the worst that can happen? So that's how I got to be chair. Well, Kelly's done an incredible job, and, and <laughs> I can tell you, being at the central office, anytime her name comes up, <laughs> who's ever face it is, it just lights up. But Aww. Kelly, we love her. She does such a great job, and she works so hard on everything, Thank and she's you. thorough, and yeah. she's ahead of everyone else, on, and she's got all this information yeah. for us. And well, so, thank you. Um, so in what ways have you, Kelly, have you benefited from this project? I could talk forever about how I benefited. I think the one most close to my heart is that I've grown so much in my academic life, but also in my personal life. I feel, one, on the academic side, I've just developed so many skills, networking skills, writing skills, critical thinking, management skills, managing 59 people um, plus sometimes. So that organizational component has just jumped leaps and bounds. Public speaking, doing a lot of like, you know, uh, I don't want to say marketing, but presenting and packaging the nice at conferences. So that's been really beneficial for me. But I also think a lot of that comes from the mentorship that I've gotten uh, from Martha, John Gray, and John Edland, as well as you know Leslie, um, some of the really central key staff at SciKai, who have just made me more confident in who I am as like a person and also as an academic. And I think that has really kind of pushed me forward in taking risks and and being confident in silly things from sending an email to all the contributors to being on panels to speaking at conferences and just taking initiative so um, that's been really beneficial but also just also like discovering my passion again for psychology and you know being reminded that promoting this diversity and engaging undergraduates in research and seeing their faces light up when they come up with their own hypotheses and research questions is, is just something that brings me a lot of joy. So, yeah, I love it. It's great. Everybody should join. <laughs> okay, well, if students or faculty wanted to get involved in, the, in this mm -hmm. project or the next one, how would they go about that? So we are working on getting an email address specifically for the NICE chair set up. So that oh, will be coming. Um, in the meantime, I would advise you to email myself. Um, so my email address is k-e-l-l-y dot c-u-c-c-o-l-o at u-n-d dot e-d-u. I'm at the University of North Dakota. Um, and then Alternatively, a great way to get involved in the project is to find our OSF page. Um, and the nice thing about it is that there's a persistent link that won't change. So that link is https colon forward slash forward slash OSF dot IO forward slash QBA seven V forward slash. In addition to Saikai's nice crowd project, there's also another one called Connect, and I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about that as well. Yeah, of course. Um, so whereas the crowd is something that occurs every academic year, there's a new crowd question every academic year that people gather around. Connect is more about um, 
fostering or building a network of collaborators interested in collaborating um, and sharing resources. So this is more intimate, I guess you could say, in that it's more individualized. People can decide how long or to what extent they want to build those relationships or the projects. Um, and that's facilitated using the study swap site. Um, and so study swap is essentially a platform for inner lab collaboration um, or replication projects. And essentially what we ask contributors to do is go to that site um, and you can just, I just Google it, study swap platform. Um, and once you get there, you can either post a have or a need. And so a have is something that you yourself have, <laughs> a resource that you're willing to share. So it could be, I have 100 intro to psych students who would be willing to take, you know, take a survey, or I have a population of um, a certain group that might be of interest to other people or a certain data set. So you would post that have with nice in the title, so that way other nice collaborators can find you and they can volunteer to help you out. Or you can post a need. So if you need a certain sample of people or maybe you need a certain measure um, or a certain piece of technology that your institution doesn't have access to, then you can post that on StudySwap with nice in the title. So again, other nice collaborators can find you and then pe you know, people will volunteer. And we found that people are very enthusiastic about helping each other out. You've just listened to another episode of Diverse Voices in the Psych Everywhere podcast. I think you'll agree that it was a pleasure getting to hear from Kelly today about Psychi Nice. Thanks for tuning in, and please be sure to leave a review for this podcast. Psychi offers many, many research experiences and opportunities throughout the year. Let me share those with you while you're here. First, we have a research measures database, which features various websites linking to measures, tools, and instruments. Second, our post a study tool allows members to post a public link to research studies that are in need of online participants. Third, many Psychi awards and grants are available to support research projects. Fourth, Psychi Journal accepts student and faculty level empirical research. That's a really great educational teaching tool. Definitely check it out if you haven't already. Fifth, and last but not least, Psychi hosts the NICE research projects. You heard all about that in today's podcast. To access these research tools, simply visit the Psychi.org website and go to the research resource image located about halfway down on the homepage. One other thing. Maybe you'd like to read Kelly's new Ion Psychi magazine article about Psychi Crowd. Please visit the Psychi website and enter the following in the search bar. Engaging in cross-cultural research with Psychi's Network for International Collaborative Exchange. Okay everyone, that's all for now. Talk to you again soon. Copyright 2019, Psychi, the International Honor Society in Psychology. All rights reserved.